Welcome. I'm Kat. I am the rector here at St. Luke's. Pulitzer Prize winner Natasha Trethewey served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. In his citation, Librarian of Congress James Billington wrote, her poems dig beneath the surface of history, personal or communal from childhood or a century ago, to explore the human struggle that we all face. She was the first Southerner to receive the honor since, William Penn, since Robert uh, Penn Warren in 1986 and the first African American since Rita Dove in 1993. In her second term as United States Poet Laureate, her signature project was a PBS NewsHour series called Where Poetry Lives, in which she traveled with senior correspondent Jeffrey Brown to cities across the United States to explore societal issues such as Alzheimer's, domestic abuse, the civil rights movement, and incarcerated teenagers, all through the prism of poetry, literature, and her own personal experiences. In addition, she held the position of State Poet Laureate of uh, the State of Mississippi from 2012 to 2016. She's received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Bellagio Study Center, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Bunting Fellowship Program of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard. In 2013, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And at Northwestern, down the block, she is the board chair, the board of trustees professor of English uh, in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Her collection, Native Guard, has been adapted for the stage and will be performed next week at Northwestern's Wirtz Theater. We invited Natasha to St. Luke's today in celebration of our patron saint, St. Luke, who was purportedly a physician and healer. Her life and work points towards healing and hope in the acts of making and elevating art. When I first reached out to Professor Trethaway about coming to St. Luke's, I described this congregation as a very literate, historically white community in Evanston. Our pews are filled with readers and writers and librarians. We are well aware that we are the church of the oppressor and are learning to live with that reality in history. Professor Trethaway said yes, and we are so grateful. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to have an interstitial conversation of uh, some conversation along with selected readings and then we will open it up to some uh, additional questions from you, from you all. Uh, so one of the things that we were really struck by in reading both um, Monument and Memorial Drive were that there were a number of instances that appear both as poems and in your memoir. And we were wondering if you might read a couple of these things and then maybe reflect on um, the experience of what it's like to do it as uh, poetry versus prose slash memoir and why you would choose mm -hmm. both in each, if you would. I would absolutely love that. Um, I was very excited to hear that um, y'all had recognized some of those things. I think one of the very first photographs that I wrote about was in domestic work uh, in a poem called Family Portrait. And that was probably one of my earliest poems as well. I'm looking I think it's it. on page seven. Okay, good. Or it was in my version. All right, let's see. Ah, yes, there it is. All right, let me read this one first. Family Portrait. Before the picture man comes, Mama and I spend the morning cleaning the family room. She hums Motown, doles out chores, a warning. He has no legs, she says. Don't stare. I'm first to the door when he rings. My father and uncle lift his chair onto the porch, arrange his things, near the place his feet would be. 
He poses our only portrait, my father sitting, mama beside him, and me in between. I watch him bother the space for knees, shins, scratching air, as years later, I'd itch for what's not there. So, an early poem, uh, one of my first poems, and perhaps one of my earliest sonnets as well. It's mm. a, a Shakespearean sonnet, as you probably could hear. Um, I write about it again in Memorial Drive because the thing that I was so struck by um, in the actual uh, experience of it was the photographer coming to the house who was a double amputee and having that curiosity of children and being told not to stare. Um, and I, it, it occurs to me that there are moments in all of our lives that um, stand out in memory. They keep coming back um, unbidden sometimes because there's something already deeply figurative in the literal experience waiting to tell us something. And that's the metaphor that comes out in the end of that, this idea of phantom ache, that there he is scratching at the air uh, where his shins would have been um, itching for, for that absence. Um, and I think when I wrote the poem at the time, I was thinking about two absences. One, um, that my parents would later be divorced and so that family unit wouldn't be the same, would not be um, whole anymore, but then also the loss of my mother. The poem just captures such a small piece of that, and so the memoir gets to expand on the larger experience. When you mentioned it to me, I was trying to see if a, another poem that I'd written about that same photograph was in this book. Oh, interesting. And it's not, um, so. because of course this is a new and selected, but I wrote about it again huh. in my book Thrall. So uh, it's not included here, but in Thrall, I wrote about it in a very different way. Hmm. Um, in Thrall, I was focused instead on uh, the gestures of the three of us in the photograph. So as I describe my father uh, sitting and my mother beside him, she's sort of, um, my father's sitting in the armchair and I'm standing between his knees and she's perched on the very edge of the arm. So it, that became a metaphor for me about how close she is to falling away. Yeah. But the thing that she's doing in the photograph um, that I focus on in another poem is that she's touching me on my shoulder. So she's right behind me and she's touching me like this. Oh, wow. And it's very much like a, a gesture of, okay, be still now because I'm kind of wiggly and she's trying to get me to be still. But it's also a metaphor for me about that imprint. Mm -hmm. um, the poem is called Mano Prieta, which means dark hand. And it was that imprint of her lovely dark hand on me that I'm focusing on in that other poem. Mm. But each time I look at a photograph, and I'm sure this is the same for many of you, you notice something you hadn't seen before. And it always has something to do with where you're at in your life at a particular moment, what you focus on. Would you be, can I ask for another specific one mm -hmm. that was really striking? Um, would you be willing to read Incident yes. on page 96? This poem ha shares a title with a famous poem by Count A. Cullen called Incident. If you don't know it, I would go Google that poem, but it's a, a, a lovely short poem that has an incident in it that is reminiscent in some ways of the incident in this poem. And given that some people might not be mm -hmm. familiar with this one, mm -hmm. could you just say a bit about the form in it before you ah, read it? Because yes. it's really striking. Oh, sure. So um, the poem is um, a pantoum. Um, it's in 
four line stanzas and uh, the repetition works in, in such that um, when you have that first four line stanza, lines two and lines four move down to the next stanza in the position of lines one and three. And then you have to write two more, two and four, and then they come down to the next line. And then finally, um, the original lines one and three, which you have not used yet, come back in reverse order as lines two and four. Thus, the poem's last line is the same as its first line. So it circles back on itself, sort of the way that memory does. Incident. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. That was a story that uh, was repeated in my family again and again about the night that the Klan came to burn a cross in my grandmother's driveway. Now, the, the story behind that, um, and some of you will remember this from reading Memorial Drive, my grandmother was... Uh, an activist in the community. Uh, she was um, assisting the church, the Mount Olive Baptist Church, which was across the street from her house during a voter registration drive to get disenfranchised African Americans registered to vote. At that same time, my parents and I were living with my grandmother briefly, and the church didn't have its own driveway, and so my grandmother would let the deacons park the church bus in her driveway. Mm. And for that reason, we were never sure if the cross burning was directed at the church for doing the voter registration drive or at my family, an interracial family living there inside the house. And this happened before you were born or when you were? When I was baby? two or three years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you go to write a strict form poem like that, do you begin with the form and say, like, we're going to write a pantoon? <laughs> or do you have the idea in your head and then the form follows? You know, with that particular poem, I had written an earlier draft of it that was um, a free verse, a kind of measured free verse poem with its little turn and epiphany at the end that um, went nowhere. Um, I knew that it wasn't a successful poem. I was so focused on the incident of the cross burning itself that I couldn't look past it to see what figurative possibilities were there. And so um, I remembered an assignment the late poet Michael Harper used to give to his students he'd get them to write a five-line autobiography. Mm. And so I, I was thinking about that, and I decided to take the entire incident and to try to write a four-line narrative. So that's where you get those four lines. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. 
that covers the entire period uh -huh. of time um, and, and sort of the erasure of it, you know, ultimately right. when the grass takes over again. So once I had that, that's when it occurred to me that if I tried um, a form like a pantoum, because you have to have these repeating lines, it would um, subvert my kind of pedestrian linear narrative tendencies um, by having to circle back. And I think it made me realize something else about the importance of the incident. It wasn't the incident itself, but the necessity for remembering. Mm. And I only got to that because the form asked me to return again and again, as memory does. On the, on the topic of form, um, and this will be the <laughs> last one here, uh, in, the, in the memoir, you include the transcript of your mother and stepfather's uh, recorded conversation, um, which is so devastating and so striking that she was doing everything right. Mm -hmm. Including being divorced from, from him, former husband, former stepfather. As did you mm -hmm. in calling the shelter mm -hmm. and, um, and, and multiple things, mm -hmm. you know, of, of failures uh, on other people's parts. Um, why did you choose to include the transcript in its entirety in a memoir? Which I think was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was a it was a really tough decision um, because well, wh what I worried about was that readers would think I was lazy. Oh, interesting. And that I was making use of the documentary evidence rather than trying to create scene and narrative around it. But it was important to me that readers could witness for themselves my mother's strength mm -hmm. and determination and patience and resilience. Um, her remarkable resolve in the face of no options. She was not willing to give in, even if it meant dying. I think that um, I could tell you how remarkable she was. And that's just the way any of us might talk about how remarkable the people we love are. But I wanted you to see it mm -hmm. for yourself so that the evidence made it incontrovertible. I also wanted to do justice to her own voice, um, to have her voice there. And uh, I have to say, it's not the whole thing. I mean, that's what's crazy. Um, it was much longer. Um, and in some ways, um, there are things that are even worse uh, or just worse because they just get repeated. Mm -hmm. It gets tedious, you know, how he keeps trying to manipulate her uh, into coming back. But I had to, they were so much longer, I did have to shorten them a little bit. I had to cut some of it out. And this is really the only thing that um, my editor, my agent helped me to do. Because it was hard to keep going back and reading them. I didn't want to read them enough to make the kind of seamless cuts that were necessary. Um, I didn't even want to read them when I got the proofs back for the book and I had to make sure there were no mistakes. If there are mistakes in it, I was like, so be it, because I can't do it again. And then I did it one more time. I recorded this audio book. Would you be willing to read the poem evidence? Mm 
on page 66. Sure. Which is, of course, a very different interpretation of the same thing. What is evidence? Not the fleeting bruises she'd cover with makeup, a dark patch as if imprint of a scope she'd pressed her eye too close to, looking for a way out. Nor the quiver in the voice she'd steady, leaning into a pot of bones on the stove. Not the teeth she wore in place of her own, or the official document its seal and smeared signature fading already, the edges wearing. Not the tiny marker with its dates, her name, abstract as history. Only the landscape of her body, splintered clavicle, pierced temporal, her thin bones settling a bit each day, the way all things do. You know, I was, um, I was working on these two books at the same time. Oh, interesting. Um, putting together the new and selected um, and uh, writing the memoir, all of the poems, uh, for the most part, all of the poems in the new section are poems that I had to write while working on the memoir. Mm -hmm. There were moments that, um, prose couldn't capture what I needed to do, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I would have to turn a page over and sketch out a poem instead. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are a couple of incidents of that, um, and I, I'd like to read those to you if I yes, could. Please. So um, they, they're really sort of the first and last uh, poems in the book. Um, there was a part that I was writing and I was thinking about my father and I was thinking about all the kinds of um, sort of uh, insensitive things that people say, um, often not intending to about domestic violence. I was thinking about how little the public often knows about domestic violence and how someone as smart as my mother could find herself in that situation. It's a question I get asked all the time. Terry Gross asked me that question uh, during an interview and I had to take a deep breath and try to explain how it might happen to someone smart. Um, and I also was thinking about um, the statistic that th the chances are, your chances increase uh, into the 70% when you leave, not when you stay. So you have a much greater chance of dying because you've chosen to leave. And so that's why to know that to know that strength, that decision, is really important. So I was thinking about all of those things and um, feeling a little, you know, angry about it, I'll admit. <laughs> and so I wrote this poem. It's the first poem in Monument. And I think it was also kind of a, an odd, maybe bold, maybe crazy decision to open my new and selected with this poem, but I wanted to set the tone. I wanted to make sure that out of the two existential wounds that I've always written from, my readers would understand the deepest one. Mm. Imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend, after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that, 
More often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence. Why would she marry a guy like that? Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words or advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue, they should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Imagine, learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else. Unburden yourself of the death of your mother and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket and seed bed, and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. You know, that same professor, famous professor who told me to unburden myself of the death of my mother, there was a, a second part of that phrase that is not in that poem. Um, he also said, um, unburden yourself of being black and uh, write about the situation in Northern Ireland. He sounds charming. Mm -hmm. Well, but I took his advice. I, I love Irish poets, so um, <laughs> Seamus Heaney helped me to write uh, my book. So here's the last poem um, in the book. Um, it's almost a way of saying, okay, if you really haven't seen the arc of this, if you really <laughs> haven't seen why I have to do this, what existential wound then here's one more chance for me to tell you. It's after uh, a painting, Miguel Cabrera's portrait of St. Gertrude from 1763. Articulation. In the legend, St. Gertrude is called to write after seeing in a vision the sacred heart of Christ. Cabrera paints her among the instruments of her faith quill, inkwell, an open book, rings on her fingers like Christ's many wounds, the heart emblazoned on her chest, the holy infant nestled there as if sunk deep in a wound. Against the dark backdrop, her face is a wafer of light. How not to see in the saint's image my mother's last portrait? The dark backdrop, her dress black as a habit, the bright edge of her afro ringing her face with light. And how not to recall her many wounds, ring finger shattered, her ex-husband's bullet finding her temple, lodging where her last thought lodged. Three weeks gone, my mother came to me in a dream her body whole again, but for one perfect wound, the singular articulation of all of them, a hole center of her forehead, the size of a wafer, light 
pouring from it. How, then, could I not answer her life with mine, she who saved me with hers? And how could I not, bathed in the light of her wound, find my calling there? Now, as you know, Memorial Drive begins with that visitation, that dream, that light, that wound. And my mother's question, do you know what it means to have a wound that never heals? And at the risk of being remarkably dense, which I can be, um, we spend a lot of time at St. Luke's thinking about each of our callings mm -hmm. and each of our vocations mm -hmm. um, as part of healing the world and doing the work of God. Uh, and we spent a lot of time pondering how you would articulate your calling mm -hmm. and you know, making beauty and bringing things to the surface mm -hmm. around race, around history, around domestic violence, mm -hmm. around educating in a white space. Mm -hmm. um, what would you what would you say is it, your calling? <laughs> well, um, to just go back to the lines of the poem, how could I not answer her life with mine? Mm. Which is obviously the the call of the faithful to a kind of devotion. Mm. You know, I'm using the metaphor of St. Gertrude right. there, who right. begins to write after the, the holy vision that she has. The first time I tried to write a poem as an adult was in the aftermath of that dream. So that my calling to write felt to me very much like uh, that moment that St. Gertrude is called mm -hmm. after her vision. So my mother with the light shining, uh, which in the dream becomes all encompassing, it's of her face. And so I'm simply bathed in that light. To answer that calling, to, to, to write, um, as Seamus Heaney would say, to try to affect the redress of poetry. Mm. Um, you know, I talk about the two wounds, the mm -hmm. two existential wounds, and that is the deeper one, losing my mother. I think I was always um, obviously interested in social justice. Um, it seemed impossible not to be having been born black and biracial in 1966 in Mississippi on Confederate Memorial Day. Right. It was as if my calling had been chosen for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Um, and yet, and so my, you know, as a child, some of my earliest poems were about social justice. Um, I can remember writing poems in the third grade uh, an elegy for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's odd to me to think now, I didn't quite realize this, he always had a presence uh, in, in my memory, um, even though you know I was only two years old when he was killed. And so he'd only been dead a few years when I was writing those poems. Um, you know, I often quote um, W.H. Auden's poem, his memorial to William Butler Yeats in which he says, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Well, Mad Mississippi hurt me into poetry. Uh, that microcosm of uh, the difficulties of racism and white supremacy in America. They became joined, my two wounds, I think. Um, and it took me a, lo a long time to see how connected they were. And I'm really, writing Memorial Drive was one part of that awareness. Some of it began to happen in writing Native Guard, too. But 
to think about my mother's death, which the individual death that can seem so small, in the shadow of that giant monument to the Confederacy, to white supremacy, to the attempt to maintain white supremacy and slavery and destroy the Union. Those two things in juxtaposition, I think are the, at the crux of my calling. And for those folks not familiar with it, you're referring to Stone Mountain in Stone outside Mountain, of Atlanta, an actual it is like an Mount actual Rushmore Mount of the Rushmore Confederacy, made of you know stone and carved. Uh, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis. They are bigger than Mount Rushmore. Um, they uh, it what took pride. a pride. Yeah, it was you know um, it's where the Klan. Um, uh, got itself uh, going again in the 20s. It took them until uh, 1972, the year that my mother and I moved to Atlanta, to complete that thing. They kept working on it. They kept using taxpayer dollars to work on it. They also used taxpayer dollars to um, restore Jefferson Davis's home. Uh, in Mississippi, and all of the uh, uh, politicians gathered around for the reopening. This was after Hurricane Katrina. Gathered around for the rededication and pledged their loyalty to the Confederacy. No. And this was before <laughs> January 6, 2021. <laughs> yes. So when we think, <laughs> where is there evidence? <laughs> There's plenty of Something evidence. Something coming up to January 6th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Having written in various forms so much about your life and mm -hmm. yourself, um, for you, does it make you feel exposed, filled with purpose? When you meet someone like me, you've mm -hmm. never met me, and I know so much about your background. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, how is that for you? Um, well, the, the wonderful part about it is that um, so many people know about my mother. Mm. Um, Gwendolyn Ann Nay Turnbow, uh, she's not erased because so many people now know about my life and her life. But you know, um, a poem, a memoir, they're all made things. They're all formed out of um, language. Uh, we make them, we shape them. The music of it, the imagery, the metaphors, it doesn't tell everything. And you're in control of what you. One tries write. to be, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and but of course, you know, there's always ways that our language reveals us um, mm. that we may not be in control of. But as in as much as I am in control of the language of shaping the narrative, um, particularly shaping things that um, I could not be in control of as a child. It, there is a, a triumph over yeah. the trauma of it and the despair. And I feel like that's the person you know. I, in, the, in the Memorial Drive, you have a passage where you're talking about um, your interaction with your stepfather. Uh, and you say, I had learned to compose myself, or I was learning to compose myself. I thought, oh, thank goodness. She's in control of this narrative. She's choosing what to write. This is <laughs> This is okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and we're going to open it up here in a second, but would you be willing to read Benediction on page 118? And, and maybe we, we all wondered a little bit about your brother. Mm -hmm. um, what page did you say that was? I think it's 118. Oh, okay. Okay. 
And we definitely geeked out on the different parts of, uh, <laughs> of that poem. Where it was yeah. <laughs> litany, liturgy, benediction. Uh -huh. It was lovely. <laughs> um, you know, I, I first wrote about my brother um, in another uh, book of nonfiction um, called Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, you know, my, my hometown, Gulfport, Mississippi, was destroyed uh, during the hurricane. My grandmother had to evacuate and could never go back to her home. Um, my brother uh, was sort of taking over the family business, uncle son's business, um, with all of the rental houses that were also wiped away. And he lost everything um, in the hurricane. Um, and so, uh, In, it, immediately following, there was a little bit of work to be done during cleanup uh, and recovery. But when that was all over and, and FEMA and all of the, the various agencies pulled away, there was, there was nothing left. And he made some um, bad decisions to transport cocaine for someone that he would never uh, reveal to the police the, the name of. Uh, I think he was worried that there would be consequences to his family. So he spent um, about 11 months in prison in Mississippi uh, for that charge. And so this poem um, is a poem about the day he was being released. Benediction. I thought that when I saw my brother walking through the gates of the prison he would look like a man entering his life, and he did. He carried a small bag, holding it away from his body as if he would not touch it or that it weighed almost nothing. The clothes he wore seemed to belong to someone else, like hand-me-downs given a child who will one day grow into them. Behind him, at the fence, the inmates were waving, someone saying, all right now. And then my brother was walking toward us, a few awkward steps at first, until he got it. How to hold up the two big pants with one hand and in the other carry everything else he had. He still lives in Atlanta now. You know, I know that, um, well, this goes back to shaping the story too. I, I think a lot about this because of your question. I know that a lot of readers have, uh, wondered about my brother. Um, and clearly, in the book, I make the decision to call it a daughter's memoir, mm -hmm. so that it is only about my relationship to my mother mm -hmm. and that loss. People also wonder about my father, more about my father. Um, People wonder about my grandmother. I've written about all of them. Uh, so, you know, that book that exists about Joe uh, is one way. But even in that book, I think I don't tell the story about losing our mother. And I try not to tell his story. I think very much about the ethics of memoir. Mm -hmm whose story we can tell um, and what we shouldn't tell. When I was working on that book about my brother, in th that, and the, the poem I read is from that, I um, was, he was still in prison and I was writing to him and he was writing notes. There were, there were actually fac facsimiles of some of my brother's letters in that book. I like documentary evidence. Um, 
but I wanted to make sure that he was not hurt by anything I was writing and not feeling misrepresented. So I wanted him to read it all. A part that I worried very much about, um, it's a part that's sort of connected to benediction, uh, was the day that my brother was being sentenced. And I was in the courtroom, and I could see that he was afraid. My brother's always so stoic. But I could see that he was afraid. He could barely speak above a whisper to the judge. And um, he seemed small. And when the sentence was read, and they were leading him out, he made this gesture um, to us like that. That was how he said goodbye. And then um, I went outside uh, with my husband uh, and my brother's uh, girlfriend. And um, we were standing in the parking lot. And a couple of people, a, a, a white woman and uh, a child, a teenager who looked to be uh, her son, with Florida license plates in a car that was dragging the ground because all of their, it seemed like all their belongings were in it. Comforters and chairs and, you know, lamps, you know, clothing. And they pulled up next to me and they asked me um, where the public library was. And I was so happy because I thought, you know, those small interactions you get to have with strangers where you help someone feels so good. And so I looked over in the direction of the public library and I made this gesture too. But the public library was no more because it had been raised in Hurricane Katrina. Oh. And it just sort of was a moment of all that devastation and all that loss. And that gesture. Um, and people who needed a library, probably for the restroom, probably some respite for the heat, from the heat, maybe the internet. That was a longer story than I meant to tell, because I wanted to say something about <laughs> letting my brother read that scene and mm. worrying that he would think that, that he wouldn't want readers to see him not looking strong. He didn't feel that way at all because what he wanted was empathy. I have one or two more, but if someone has a question on their heart, the mic is in the aisle, so please be empowered, but I do have some more. We had one question uh, from a children's librarian <laughs> um, asking who you liked to read when you were growing up. Oh, that's a good question. Well, um, some of the books that I had on my shelves when I was a, a girl, um, I had The Little Prince. I had Black Beauty, The Call of the Wild. I had um, Where the Wild Things Are. I, I'm sort of not going in order of, of age appropriate, I think. 
Um, oh, you know, um, I had this set of books that uh, my mother got for me that um, the child that they were purchased for could be a character in the story. Do you guys know about these books? Sure. Yeah. So I was a character and um, there the, the other character was a, a giraffe who um, had my name backwards. <laughs> This is probably not the best place to tell this, but I just can't stop. Has anyone thought about my name backwards? A hashtun? What is no, no, it's worse. Okay, <laughs> let me just say, my mother, the, the, she shortened it in the book so that my name in the book was Tasha, my nickname, and so the giraffe's name was Asat. Someone's getting it, yes. Okay, so pal there's a, you know what a palindrome is, right? Yeah, a man, yeah. a plan, a canal, Panama. Yeah. Okay, so there's another one. Ah, Satan sees Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want a giraffe named Ah, Satan, so. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, I love the diary of Anne Frank. I think I probably read that in the fourth or fifth grade. Um, and then, you know, uh, the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. I loved um, Encyclopedia Brown. Um, and, and then, you know, I started reading more, uh, you know, adult novels a little, uh, you know, when I was still a kid. You know, my father was insisting that I read Wuthering Heights, which is still one of my favorites and then The Great Gatsby, and then Light in August, and all while I was still a kid. Are you but the first thing I memorized Gaelic? was uh, the Gettysburg Address. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> while we're talking, asking about reading, uh, could I ask a general question and a specific one? You mentioned, mentioned several, a whole bunch of poets in, in the books. One in particular, Robert Penn Warren, and I wonder if you would talk about those poets and Southern poets in general, or Southern writers, and the complicated relationship with them that I assume you have. Mm -hmm. And a specific question, were you thinking of Camus and the stranger at the beginning of Memorial Drive? I was not, but tell me why you think so. The what is it, three weeks ago, mother is dead, the tense. Mm, right. And the stranger begins, aujourd'hui maman est morte. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps it is that way that we are made of everything we've read before, <laughs> right? It's best if it's good stuff that we've read. <laughs> I tell my students, if you fill your mind with like dime store novels, that's what you're gonna write. Um, that, the question about Robert Penn Warren and um, the fugitive poets and the agrarians, um, I want to read a poem to answer that question. And I'm assuming that I included it. Oh, it's, yes. Yes, it's in there. Okay. Let's see what page it is. Oh, there it is. Um, you know, I, I did my final lecture on, at the Library of Congress on Robert Penn Warren. Um, because he's such a compel compelling figure to me, um, particularly because as a public figure, we were, he was changing before our eyes. Um, the young man who uh, wrote uh, the, um, the essay in I'll Take My Stand is not the same Robert Penn Warren uh, who just 20 years later was at the Library of Congress doing research um, and participating in various social justice issues. Uh, he was interested in the civil rights movement. He wrote The Legacy of the Civil War and Segregation where you see him rethinking his earlier positions and 
changing. And I think that that is even more important than him finally being completely reconstructed by the time he died, which he probably wasn't, or any of us, completely reconstructed. But the effort, the transformation, that is, I think, what I value more about him. And, and just, you know, how wonderful his work is. Tell me a story of deep delight. Hmm. But he becomes sort of a central figure in this poem, pastoral. In the dream, I am with the fugitive poets. We're gathered for a photograph. Behind us, the skyline of Atlanta, hidden by the photographer's backdrop, a lush pasture, green, full of soft-dyed cows, lowing, a chant that sounds like no, no. Yes, I say, to the glass of bourbon I'm offered. We're lining up now, Robert Penn Warren, his voice just audible above the drone of bulldozers, telling us where to stand. Say, race, the photographer croons. I'm in blackface again when the flash freezes us. My father's white, I tell them, and rural. You don't hate the South, they ask. You don't hate it? That is a, that poem ends with a, a, a revision of a line um, from Faulkner, the end of Absalom, Absalom. I don't hate the South. I don't hate it. Well, we are so grateful that you made it north. <laughs> Can I tell you how grateful I made it north? <laughs> so uh, I live on Forest Avenue, and I still get m mail from Mississippi with Forest spelled with two R's. <laughs> That's Nathan Bedford, but I do not live on that forest. <laughs> My first Halloween here, I opened the door and a child was in a Civil War uniform, and it was a Union uniform. <laughs> we'll take it. Yes. <laughs> well, we are going to have uh, bookends and beginnings. We'll be doing some sales, and Natasha is gracious enough to be doing some signing. Um, but we, before we move into then, may we thank our wonderful guest. Thank you.